was just telling Ben, one of the reasons I guess I'm still singing is because all those nights I sang here on Sunday night, and all those hymn sings we did, and all the choir music and the cantatas and the programs, and I just thank God that I can still sing and, um, and praise His name. Praise His name. All right, I'm going to read the scripture. If you would please stand for just one minute as I read this scripture. Found in 1 John, verses 1, 1 through 10. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have now seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us, that which we have not seen and heard, declare we unto you that ye may also have fellowship with us and your joy may be full. Then this is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. You may be seated. <clears throat> you know what? I, I want to... I want to let you know beforehand, I've already filtered this through my own life. And, you know, one of the things that we have to watch as church, as church people, as, as members of the body of Christ, that we have to make sure that we are right with God. There's a lot of people out there. I remember going to a, a college party at Alderson Bross one time. I walked into this party. It was a frat party. And I walked in, and the first guy I met said, I'm a Christian. I said, well, I'm a Christian too. He said, yeah, I'm a Christian. I said, okay. Well, later on that night, he was doing things that were not Christian. Terrible things that were not Christian. And I thought, how can you proclaim to be of Christ and do these things? It just doesn't work, does it? You know, they'll know us. They'll know us by the things we do, the way we say things. You know, there's two kinds of sinners in the world. Oh, there's two, Pastor? Two kinds of sinners? I thought you say there's two kinds of people. No, tonight we're going to look at there's two kinds of sinners in the world. There's the lost sinner who's never trusted Christ. They've never been born again. Christ is nowhere on their radar screen. They have left Christ out of their lives, and they are lost. You know, I don't ever assume, even on my Sunday morning at, up in Girard, I never assume that everyone in this place is saved. I never assume that. Because if you are lost, you need to do something about that tonight. Like I say this morning, Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. And I've heard many beautiful sermons. And I heard a bunch here at, at Moundsville Baptist, didn't we? And we heard a ton. One guy came up to me one time. He says, I, I don't think I'm going to church. I don't think it's doing me any good. I said, well, wait a minute. You, you eat breakfast every morning, do you? How long have you been eating breakfast? He said, I've been eating breakfast all my life. I said, can you remember all the breakfasts you've ever had? He said, no. I said, well, same way with sermons. But you know what? Just like that breakfast, it sure did you good, didn't it? It did you good. It touched somewhere in your heart and in your mind, and you did some change, and you did some correction. You did some things that, that glorified God. Even though I don't remember every sermon. Now I know every sermon I've preached since I've left here because I have it on the computer. I have it in my files. I know every funeral sermon I've done. I've done, I've done every wedding that I've done because I keep a record. You know, we've heard many beautiful sermons, 
how God is with us every hour until we die. And in those sermons, everyone goes to heaven. It's kind of like a don't worry, be happy concept. This implies that, that this is true for everyone. Sounds really good. Sounds really beautiful. But church, it is just not true. It is not true. Jesus says in John 14, 1, 3, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am ye may be also. This scripture said that, I say that at most funerals. And there has to be a clarification here. And I always say this at every funeral. Because again, I cannot assume that everyone at that service is saved. And I always tell them after I read this scripture that heaven is a prepared place for a prepared person. And the only way that you can be prepared is that you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Then you're prepared. And it includes another word, a word that we sometimes don't want to hear. And that word is repentance. Repentance. Repentance toward God and repentance toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, repentance is a lost word in our world today, you know. Some preachers, some preachers never mention it, and southern, southerners slide over it, make it real quick. But this is a necessary word. Let me ask you some questions. You don't have to answer out loud. I just want you to think about this. Does God promise to be with evil, sinful people as much as he does with those who follow him and keep his commandments? You think about that question. The second question is, does God promise a heavenly home and all its glory to sinful people who ignore him throughout their lives and live for this world only? Think about that. You know the answers to these questions. All through this holy book. All through this holy book. The B-I-B-L-E, you know, basic instructions before leaving earth. B-I-B-L-E. All through this holy book, you'll find God's promises are for his followers. Those who are called the children of God. Not everyone is saved and on their way to heaven. That's called universalism. People who believe this are lost because they've never trusted in Jesus Christ as their Lord. Or their Savior. Now the other group is called the saved sinners. Uh-oh, Pastor Burrow's about to, he's heading for my toes. He's starting to meddle. Then there are the saved sinners. And I want to tell you, church, I am in this number. I am in this number. I am a sinner, what? Saved by what? By grace. God's grace. Wonderful grace. We all have come to Christ through repentance and faith. And God has saved us. And he gives us a new nature, because we're supposed to take off the old man and put on the new. But he doesn't destroy the old carnal nation. It's still there. It's still with us. And sometimes, are you with me? It gets the best of us. And Paul was a great example, one of the greatest Christians to ever live and serve Christ. Yet in 1 Timothy 1.15, he says he's the chief of sinners. And he says he fought the two natures. There's a little saying that we say during Bible study. Two natures beat within my breast. One is foul, the other one's blessed. The one I love, the one I hate. The one I feed will dominate. You got to think about what are you feeding? What are you holding on to? Many followers of Christ are surprised to discover that when they become Christians, their old nature is still with them. Oh, man. I remember when I got saved when I was 12, I went home, I sat on the edge of my bed, and I sang hymns. I just sang hymns. And I felt so much at peace. My sins were washed away. You remember the old story? Person laying in the bed, they go, Lord, 
Lord, I, I just woke up from a restless sleep. I'm, I'm doing really good, but Lord, in a minute, I'm going to get up and I'm going to need you to help me through this day. You know, we still carry a desire to sin. We still carry the devil wanting to trip us up. We war against the old nature. And Paul encourages us to put on the armor of light. We read it earlier. I hope you didn't miss it. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. According to the Bible, every born-again believer is a saint. Not a perfect saint, not a perfect in this life, but perfect in their position toward God. And let's talk about some of the more common sins of the saints. The first one is the sin of worldliness. Now watch that, Pastor. Well, the sin of worldliness is anything in this world that takes your attention away from God and His church. There's a lot of great and beautiful things out there, a lot of places to see great entertainment, and great organizations to belong to, and lots of, you know, the entertainment concerts. But let's face it, there are so many hours in the day, and, and these things are not bad. I, I mean, I love to go to a concert, and I love to go to a game. I love to, I love to be a part of, of organizations. They bring pleasure, and they bring satisfaction. They bring, some brings prestige. But beware, it can easily misplace our love. It can misplace our loyalty. It can even misplace our duty, our duty to Christ. The greatest sin of the church and Christians today is permitting the things of this world to become between them and Christ and his church. That's the sin of worldliness. In C.S.'s book, Mere Christianity, he wrote, if you read history, you'll find that the Christians who did the most for this present world were just those who thought of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world, think of heaven, that they become so ineffective in this world. Aim at heaven, and you'll get earth thrown in. Aim at earth, you'll get neither. The second sin is the sin of prayerlessness. Prayer is a vital thing to every believer. You know, I, I talk to a lot of people when they say, well, Pastor, I, I don't know how to pray. I said, well, you've come to the right place because Jesus taught his disciples to pray, and I'm going to teach you how to pray. And sometimes people say, Pastor, can you pray for me? I'll say, let's pray right now. And I always tell people, they say, oh, Pastor, thank you for the prayer. I, say, I always tell them, you know what? You needed the prayer. I needed the practice. It works out for everybody, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. We know all this, yet as a pastor, I have to remind myself, that we need to pray without ceasing. We turn to the Bible and see examples of a vibrant and needed prayer. Like Jesus was our example. Jesus was always praying. He'd go off and pray, or he'd pray right there with his disciples. Jesus was the Son of God with all power and wisdom, yet he felt he needed to keep in touch with his Father. Christ prayed on so many occasions. Now, if Christ needed this, we need it all the more. Amen? He went away and prayed and then and when was the last time we've done that? You know? Paul prayed. He told his disciples to pray. Saying, By the way, I pray when I'm driving. I don't shut my eyes, though. I keep my eyes open. But, I, but you know how to pray. You're saying that prayer, Lord. If I get a call to a hospital, I'm in the car praying, Lord, I don't know what to say. I don't know what the situation is. All I know is when I get there, can you give me the words? Can you let me know what's going on? <laughs> you know? Paul is saying that we need to live so close to God that every breath we breathe should almost be a prayer. Prayer is communion with God. It's communication with God. And we can't do that if we're far away from Him. We've got to draw close. Draw close to our Heavenly Father. When I was a chaplain at Ruby Memorial, uh, the, the, the chaplains on our orientation day we had a few new doctors. We toured the hospital. They showed us where the cafeteria was. I was so glad they showed me that. Then they showed us all the different floors. They showed us the emergency room. The last place they took us was to the chapel. And our tour guide 
I don't think she understood who her audience was. We, uh, she says, I hope you never have to use this place. But we as chaplains used it every day. We used it uh, when crisis was happening. We used it when patients were going home, when God performed miracles. We used it when people were critically, critically ill or dying. We used it for that. We prayed when things were going right. We used it daily before all these things happened too. One, re one major reason to pray is because we have sin. We have sin. If we sin daily, we have to confess that sin daily. And we can't get through to God unless sin is confessed. In Isaiah, God calls out Israel's sin, and the first thing he said was, you did not call on me. You did not call on me. One of the frustrations as a pastor is when somebody's in the hospital or something's going on, and I don't know about it till later. You did not call on me. I didn't hear. We need to pray because like Israel, God has blessed and prospered them, prospered us, and they had forgotten him. They had declared their impendence from, Lord, take the day off. I don't need you today. I got things under control. Don't you worry about it. They thought they could get along without him. We don't need God's grace and mercy. We got all we need. Every convenience. Really, who needs God? I will tell you this, church. We cannot take one second of this world without the creator of this world in it. In our lives. In our thoughts. In our minds. People say, Pastor, what are you doing? And sometimes I can tell them, well, I got Jesus on my mind and my mind on Jesus. They're like, really, what else were you doing? That's what I'm doing. I'm thinking about God. I'm thinking about the next service. I'm thinking about the scripture. I'm, I'm praying for those in need. We need to get back to God in a meaningful, genuine prayer life. Then there's the sin of neglect. We neglect this book, the B-I-B-L-E, God's Holy Word. It's the best-selling book in the world, and it's the least read book also. It's God's love letter to us. I love, you know what, church? We still, Sharon, we still sing written in red up in Gerard. Everybody sung it so much, the choir, Pam, she could probably sing it by heart. So I won't ask her to come up and sing it for you. I'll let her rest. But written in red, and now we tell them, this is God's, some people say, this is God's rule book. And he's counting the rule. No, this is God's love letter. I love you. I love you. That's what Calvary said. I love you. I love you. Written in red. <laughs> it says, uh, A.W. Tozer said, nothing less than the whole Bible can make a whole Christian. Sometimes people say, Pastor, can you, can you speed this up? I got somewhere to go later. Can you like shorten your sermon? I said, like, you want me to do a sermonette? Yeah. I said, well, I can't do that. I heard a pastor once tell me, if you do a sermonette, you'll produce Christianettes. So I cannot do this. I have to preach the whole word. Nothing, everything good in our nation, our personal lives, and in this church is good because of the influence of this Bible. Everything good. Everything good. Because it contains God's truth. Did you know there's a black market in Russia and other countries for obtaining the Bible? Even though there's a lot of organizations handing Bibles out and getting it over, there still is a black market. There's many people that will pay a whole day's wage to get a Bible. They're willing to give them, they're willing to give a cow for a Bible. You know, or, or a month's salary for a single copy. Yet we have instant access to God's Word daily. It's been said a worn-out Bible signifies a life that is not. We need not to neglect the gathering of ourselves together. Remember the days when this sanctuary was full? The church is the only institution in the world founded by Jesus Christ. And when you accept Him, you become a part of this glorious institution. 
We can't neglect our coming to church. When you neglect the church, you neglect the claim Jesus Christ has on your life, and then you'll lose touch with Jesus. On 1912, the luxury ship Titanic set sail. The captain said it was so safe that even God could not sink it. Kind of brash, isn't it? Even God couldn't sink it. So on Sunday night, when everybody was eating, drinking, and making merry, the ship's radio officer received five warnings concerning icebergs in the area. When the sixth warning came over, the radio operator replied, Shut up, I'm busy. Thirty minutes later, the ship was going down, and many lives were lost. See, the devil wants to keep you busy and divide you from, some, from others so you can neglect your attendance here, not even come to the service, to your church, and by your actions and our voices, we will say, shut up, I'm busy. And your life, like the Titanic, will sink away into uselessness and be lost. In every church, not just this one, people get their feelings hurt and they quit the church. Vance Havner said uh, one time some people came up, Vance Havner is an old country preacher. I love Vance Havner. Vance Havner, the couple came up and said, well, well, well Pastor Vance, we're, we're, um, we're going to another church. We're not getting anything here. And old Vance looked at him. He says, hey, you can do what you want, but there's no sense in changing the label on an empty bottle. It's in us. It's in us. I've had my, my feelings hurt too as pastor. I've had my, you know, and I'm sure it won't be the last time I get my feelings hurt. But I'll tell you this, church, it has never made me want to turn my back on my Lord Jesus Christ. I've told people when they've come to me saying, I, you know, I tell them, look, you let nothing, nothing come between you and your Lord Jesus Christ. You let nothing come between you and your service to God in the church that you're. You let nothing come between that. Let me ask you something. Has anyone ever spit in your face? Has anybody ever lashed you until blood ran down your back? Has anyone ever pushed a crown of thorns down on your head? Has anyone ever hung you on a cross? Of course not. But they did it to our Lord Jesus Christ. The religious, the religious people did that. But Jesus didn't quit. Jesus went all the way for you. How far are you willing to go for him? The church is your lifeline. And you will find no place of happiness and joy apart from the church in serving God. I believe to quit circumvents God's growth, God's grace, and God's forgiveness in your life. Well, okay, now, Pastor, I'm almost done. But I have to say this. We don't want to neglect the stewardship of giving. I want to remind us that we don't own a thing. Everything is God's. All we have belongs to God. And it's not that we can't afford to give. I believe you can't afford not to give. You got to do it. God promises that when we are faithful in giving, he will open the windows of heaven and pour out his blessing on us. And a lot of our problems and trials come because we refuse to be cheerful givers. And this comes from a sin of ingratitude. We are the children of God. Remember who we are. We take all the blessings of God and forget to say thank you. We neglect to say thank you to those around us who are blessing us. And who doesn't love to be thanked? I thank you, church, for having me come back. I thank you for listening to God's songs. I thank you for your prayers, not just now, but way back. I thank you for your help in becoming a pastor. I thank you for the hospitality shown today by Dave and Christy and, and Colleen and Ed. I thank you for that hospitality. I thank you. I thank Ben for letting me lead the singing tonight. He's got a new baby. He needs the rest. God gave us a beautiful day today when we know everyone has lost everything in Hurricane Helena, and there's another hurricane coming. 
Millions of people of the world go bed hungry while we have plenty, don't we? Millions have never heard the saving words of our Savior, and yet we have heard and acknowledged Him and our blood bought and glory bound. When was the last time you got on your knees and thanked Him that by His grace you are made perfect in Him? And this comes from the sin of the wrong attitude. And we need to watch how we talk, and we need to watch how we walk, and we're, we're bombarded every day with, with foul language and road rage. Boy, I tell you, the other day, I didn't move fast enough at the light. Man, I heard it. Beep, 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 beep. I'm like, oh, my goodness. Remember, it harms your testimony for Christ. It sets a bad example for the unchristian person. James 3, 9, 11 says, With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God, out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brother, these things not meet not ought to be. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter at the same opening? We need to lay our tempers and our language at the feet of Jesus. And let Jesus help us to get rid of that. Lastly, there is the sin of silence. Do you remember Kitty Genovese? This was a case in New York City where she was attacked by a man and killed while 38 people watched and never said a word and never dialed 911 for help. 38 people watched this. Not one of them lifted a finger to help or dial for help. And they are guilty of the sin of silence. We say that is terrible, and it is. And yet we let everything and anything get in the way of telling others about a Savior who loves them and wants to give them heaven. All around us, people are dying from sin. They're on their way to eternal doom, and yet we stand by and do nothing. You know, the only thing you can take to heaven is the person sitting next to you, is the person that lives next to you, the person that you work next to. That's all you can take. We are to fill heaven up with the saints. Today, many Christians are at ease in Zion. They're safe and on their way to heaven, but don't care about anyone else. It could be a member of your family. It could be a neighbor, coworker. Don't be silent. Tell them about your concern. Tell them you're praying for them. Tell them you want them to be with you in heaven someday. Just speak out for Jesus. You know, these are just some sins of the saints. It's not, it's not an exhaustive. So what do you do about him? You do what King David did. You repent. You cry out to God for his forgiveness, and then you walk more closely with the Lord. And God will meet you more than halfway. You remember Tom Thumb? Tom Thumb was only like 26 inches tall. You remember elementary school when they used to have the Tom Thumb weddings? You know, they'd have the short little kid, and they'd do Tom Thumb. Well, Tom Thumb toured with P.T. Barnum, P.T. Barnum Circus. He was, he was short. He was seen by millions. He traveled the world. And he's buried in the Mount Grove Cemetery at Bridgeport, Connecticut. And they gave him a life-size statue on his grave. He made a fortune. He made a fortune. But did you know there's another person buried at the Mountain Grove Cemetery in Bridgeport, Connecticut. This is a lady, a woman, by the name of Fanny Crosby, who wrote so many beautiful hymns. Fanny Crosby gave her life to God. Tom Thumb gave his life to the world. It is noted that a thousand people ask to see Fanny's grave for everyone to see Tom Thumb. What a difference. All that's on her stone is in memory of Aunt Fanny. That's on her gravestone. In closing, when it comes time for each of us to leave this earth and meet Jesus, only one thing will count. Not how much money you made, not how famous you became, not how many friends you have, 
The only thing that will matter is your service to Christ and His church. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, confess your sins and make Him Lord and Savior. And Christians, turn away from the sins of the saints. Resolve to give your best to God. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confess your sin right now and come to them. And the last question I leave for you is, do you want to get right with God? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, strengthen your saints. Strengthen this church. Strengthen the leadership. Strengthen Ben. Strengthen Junes. Strengthen Linda. Strengthen all the sound people all the deacons, all the ushers. And more, most of all, strengthen the saints who come. And Lord, we're not perfect. We live in an imperfect world, but we know, Lord, you are a perfect God who wishes none to be lost. And so, Lord, we give these to you. We give this service to you. And Lord, as we leave, May we leave in confidence that we know who we are. We know where we're going. And we know, Lord, we have a story to tell. We sang it earlier. I love to tell the story. Lord, this week I ask you to give opportunities to each one of us here to tell your story. And just like you told Moses, you would give them the words to say. Lord, we ask you to bless us and keep us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.